I hope everyone's excited. It is now September 2nd. We are now in the ninth month of the second year of the pandemic. We are still virtual, obviously, here. We were hoping that we would be in person by September, but we all had that little glorious three weeks of summer, and then everyone went back to, uh, back to lockdown. So I hope everyone's excited so we can have people from all around the world. When we do return to in person, whenever that may be, we will continue with the virtual portion now that we've learned how to do it better than we used to. Before the pandemic, we tried live streaming the meetups, but the audio never quite worked out. But now that we can just throw a Zoom on the presenter's laptop, we will do virtual again um, once we resume to in person, but I don't know when in person is gonna be. We just don't know when that's gonna happen. Depends when people feel comfortable and when companies give us space in their uh, New York City offices. So first thing I always like to do whenever we start the meetups is say, who is hiring? Now, of course, not everyone could jump up on here. In fact, no one can jump up on here really and say they're hiring because no one else could be on screen besides the three of us who are already here. So if you have a job that you're looking to fill, you can go to the job posting channel of the NY Hackr Slack. I will throw up the NY Hackr Slack in the chat here, uh, the link to join the Slack if you're not a member, or, member already. There's a job posting channel, post a job there if you're looking to hire. Go there if you're looking to get hired. There's the link for nyhackr.org slash slack.html. And beneath that is actually the direct link to, um, to the channel. Since I am on the screen, I will take advantage of that and say that I am, have three open positions, four open positions. We are hiring an account executive, a Shiny developer, a R admin. That's right, an admin. So that means like a Linux sysadmin, but specializing in R, and a data scientist. So if you're interested in any of those roles working for Lander Analytics, message me. You can find me on Slack. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me at jarrettlander.com, at landeranalytics.com. Many, many ways to find me. It's uh, very, very, uh, very easy to find a way to get in touch with me. So I hope everyone has their favorite snack. I have pizza, which we all know is a mainstay of the meetup. And I have some good cheese lock there. It's staying in place. Even the basil staying in. We have some good charring from a wood burning oven underneath it. Yes, I did already get started in one slice. That's why a bite is taken out, but I'm okay with that. I have had to get started early because the pizza came here a little earlier than I expected. I already fed some of it to my son and my wife. They all got to eat pizza. It was amazing. So I hope everyone has your favorite snack. In fact, let us know where you got your favorite snacks from in the chat, in the Slack chat, or in here. Let us know where you got your snacks from. Hopefully pizza, but I respect people who want to eat food that's not pizza. I don't know why you would, but sure, go for it. Um, so that's our pizza. And of course, we can't be here in person. I wish we could be. Um, we could all have pizza again and do the pizza poll. We haven't done the pizza poll in like a year and a half. And I'm really sad that we haven't collected more data for that. Hopefully soon. So yesterday were the workshops for what is now the seventh annual New York R Conference. We had a lot of fun. We had Max Kuhn, David Robinson. We had Lucy D'Agostino, and I always forget her last or second last name. Sorry, Lucy. Malcolm Barrett, Dan Chen, Cass Sakamoto, and Yaron Janssen's all teaching these great workshops. So that means the conference takes place next week. This year, we did the workshops the week before, trying something new. We had the meetup the week before this week. So next week is the conference, September 9th and 10th. We have two full fun days of R. At last month's meetup, I was talking about how excited we were for it to be in person. But it's going to be virtual now, completely virtual. We changed on a dime. We have a great team here. Nicole, who uh, was here in this meetup, did a great job pivoting to fully virtual. We are sad we won't get to be there in person. We are sad we won't get to eat all that great food. We had pizza and ice cream and avo toast planned. We had these great speakers coming. We still have the great speakers. They're going to be virtual. And we're going to do as much fun as we can have virtually. We've gotten good at this. This will be now our third conference between the New York conference and the government conference. We've gotten good at it. So I hope to see a lot of you there. Uh, if you would like to attend and you haven't bought a ticket yet, there is a discount code for the meetup because this conference started seven years ago because I wanted to take what we did at the meetup one hour a month and say, let's do two full days of it. So this conference is really meant for this meetup. So you could use code NYHACKR for a 20% discount. This way you could uh, get a chance to enjoy it more. We're also running a diversity scholarship for underrepresented groups. Tomorrow is the last day to sign up for it. Uh, there hopefully is going to be a link in the chat because I don't remember the link for it. But if you are a member of an underrepresented group, you can go to that form, fill it out to get a diversity scholarship to attend. Uh, so go there, fill it out, come join us. As part of the conference, a tradition we started a few years ago, we have an art auction. 
And one of the artists is with us right now. Jacqueline, could you show us what we'll be auctioning off? That's right. Um, so I have here, I had made a print earlier this year of David and Goliath, and this is the original. It was stored in safety um, and it's a gouache 11 by 14. And you can be the one and only person who owns this and you raise money for charity by buying it. Um, I, I'm very proud of it. I think it'll look good on any wall. Um, so there you go. That is really awesome. I always get jealous because I don't bid on anything here because I think it'd be weird if I want a piece of art at my conference. <laughs> so I'm always jealous of the great piece of art. One year, actually, the Robinson siblings, they all bought me a piece of art. And it was like, it was like it brought a tear to my eye. It was amazing. Uh, it, was like, it was like, I wanted it so badly. Um, I don't have it here. It's still, it's, at my, it's still at my New York office, hanging up when no one is. It's the only thing there in the office anymore. Anyway, so the art auction is going to be awesome. And Jacqueline mentioned it. I didn't. The money is being donated to the R Foundation. You know, it's a cause we can all get behind here. Um, that's where we're going to send the money to. So come for the art auction. You can go there right now. The link is in the chat. So for today's meetup, we obviously can't ask questions of Jacqueline directly because that just doesn't work, right? So I'm going to ask everyone to ask your questions either in the Zoom chat that's right here. Um, you can ask, ask it right in there or in Slack. There is a channel called Monthly Meetup Chat, very properly named. Go there for questions or just chatting. Let us know where you got your pizza from there or your non-pizza. Uh, let us know what's in there and ask questions there. At the end of the talk, I will collate the questions and I will ask them of Jacqueline and Jacqueline will answer. I hope, unless you refuse to answer, I don't know why. We'll so, see, who knows? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so with that, we have our questions being asked there. We have the conference next week. We're super excited. And we will announce, oh, by the way, we will announce the October meetup as soon as we get that scheduled, things are throwing a little haywire because we're not going to be in person, it seems. So we're going to get that scheduled and announce it within the next few weeks, sometime after the conference, because that's our focus for the next week. All right. With that, everyone, I'm very excited. As a past conference speaker, I've uh, known Jacqueline for many years now, actually. It's been quite a long time. So everyone, please welcome Jacqueline for a very exciting talk. I'm going to give you a little virtual applause. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Loud crowd. Um, okay. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. Um, Cool. I'm assuming you can all see my screen. Um, I'm going to do one or two minor things here with the Zoom. And away we go. So um, like, OK, before we even start getting a talk, let's it's Thursday night. We're about to have a long weekend. You know, the last thing we all want to do is sit here and go through a very formal talk of very serious stuff. So we're going to let's kick it back for like 45 minutes and let's just have some fun. And we're gonna talk about a fun thing tonight, which is being ridiculous. And in fact, in particular, what we're gonna talk about is about that time I made an entire e-commerce platform in Shiny. Shiny was not designed or was not necessarily built with the intention of using it for e-commerce, but I found a way to do it. And for the next 45 minutes or whatever, um, I will talk to you about all the sort of uh, things that went into that and some um, antics that ensued because of it and the ultimate result. So to start, what is GGIRL? GGIRL is an e-commerce platform that was made in Shiny by me, hence the talk. Uh, but in particular, what does GGIRL do? Well, if you notice, like there's so many good GG2 plot plots out there that people make, right? You see on Twitter, these beautiful plots, even the accidental art is actually quite pretty. Um, so there are all these cool, plots out there, but they're all stuck on computer screens. And I find this to be a problem. I think art should exist in the physical realm, not just the electronic realm. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about different ways one could make art from ggplot2s into real life. And eventually, with brainstorming help from other people, including um, Heather Nolis, I came up with the idea, or I, I got to the idea of um, ggirl, which is a gg, or an R package that will take your gg plot and turn it into things in the physical realm. So for instance, you can take your ggplot and order it as a postcard as shown below. And so you run a function and it turns it in two weeks, you will get a postcard or your friends or whoever will get these postcards. Um, you can order art prints and you can order watercolors. Um, these things cost money to print. And so I am not a charity. I'm not the R charity. I require payment so I can go do these, which meant that somehow I needed to make an R package that actually got money from you. And to date, I think, this might be the only package that I know of that is built in financial transfers as part of it, um, which is a new exciting frontier in capitalism. Um, and so that's neat. Um, and you can actually use this package right now at 
github.com slash jnull slash ggirl and has lots of detailed instructions on how to use it. Uh, as you can see there on the left is a ggplot2 I made. And on the right is the postcard that got sent to me of it um, sitting on my post or on my mailbox. Um, you can also see here there's GG postcard function to order a postcard. You can order an art print. So there are three um, art prints over there on the left, all made from GG plot two. You can order them in 11 inches by 14 inches, portrait and landscape. You can order them all the way up to 24 inches by 36 inches. That, if you think about it, is enormous. Um, and you can order that from R. Then on the right is GG watercolor, the latest function in the family of GG IRL functions, which is you take a GG plot and I will paint it as a watercolor for you as a custom commission, which is neat. Um, you can actually see the picture in the center on the left is what I watercolored on the right. Um, you have a GG plot, I'll paint it for you. But for most of this talk, uh, let's assume we're talking about the postcard version of this function. We'll talk about the other ones at the end, but like. They're all mostly the same with a few twists. And I think the postcard one is the most technically interesting. So let's talk about that. So the idea that you run our code and then eventually a postcard ends up somewhere with an image on it. Wild. Um, so the easiest way to start explaining it is to just show a demo of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up our studio and I have some pre-written lines of code. I'm going to do a special option because I want to run the dev version because I don't want to pay for a postcard. I don't want to put my credit card information in front of you. Um, but basically, what you do is you, in you install, you, you open up ggplot2 and ggirl. And then first, let's just make some generic plot. There's my plot on the left or on the right. Directions, am I right? Uh, there's my plot on the right. It's not very interesting, but it is technically a ggplot. Assume you could make a more interesting one when using this package. There are examples available too if you want some ideas. So then you give the contact email address so I know where to send like the confirmation email to, the message you want on the postcard, the address to send that postcard to. And you take all of those. And then here's the magic. You run this function gg postcard with those parameters. And so it's thinking. Doo, 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 doo. Um, and then actually, this is really interesting. What's happening right here is the shiny server that I'm using isn't fully online yet. So the package is like, uh oh, the server isn't online yet. Let's just wait 10 seconds and try it again. This is because I haven't tested it right before the demo or before this talk. So I mean, let's hope this works. Oh, good. It looks like it's working. Great. And so now it brings us to a web page. This web page shows that image ready to be on a postcard. It gives you a little bit of details around it. It shows you what the message is on the back and the address it's sending it to. This is a table because you could send multiple postcards at once if you are sending out, say, or like baby uh, birth notifications, which someone once did on this package, which is really cool. Um, you can also have different custom messages for each of the addresses you're going to. So like you could customize that a fair bit. Um, but anyways, this is a, a, a shiny web page, which has exactly one button on it, pay and submit. So you hit pay and submit, and it brings you to Stripe. I do not own and operate Stripe. Stripe owns Stripe. You can see the URL is now a Stripe one. So somehow I managed to get the user from Shiny to Stripe and with the correct payment information in here. And so this is the test mode. So I can put in the fake credit card because I don't want you guys to have my credit card, which is 4242. I'm going to make up a fake month and year, uh, a fake code. My name's going to be Jay Nolis. And my address is going to be here in Seattle. And a two, two. It correctly calculates tax, which is neat. And then I hit pay. It's thinking. Do, 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 And then, ding, it goes back and it says success. Your GG order has been placed. GG IRL order has been placed. Um, by the way, GG IRL stands for GG plots in real life. It's not G girl. That's a common debate. Anyway, so now we're back on Shiny. And then if I open up my email, I should, if I accidentally typed in the right email address. Yeah, I have an order confirmation. So that order confirmation in it has that postcard image, has that address. And if I actually paid money in one to two weeks, I would get a physical postcard with me. Now, if I were clever, I would have held one right up and say, it looks exactly like this. But somehow in this giant set of drawers is all of the examples I've made and I can't find them. But assume I'm holding a physical postcard of what it looks like and you're all impressed. Wow, that's a lot that's done with Shiny. Um, OK, so that's the demo. Let's go back to the talk. So a lot just happened. And let's talk about that. So there are actually two totally distinct components here. One is GGIRL, which is the R package that I use to interface with a server. 
And then there's the back end, which is GGIRL server, which does everything else. It does that shiny preview, it does the Stripe stuff, it does sending the postcard and the packet or and the um the email confirmation. Uh, so all of that's handled by a different thing. You may ask, why couldn't I just done this all as one package? Couldn't I have done that all locally? It's like, well, if I did that, then you probably could have like hacked it. You know, if I did it all on the client side, then you could have hacked it and like automatically sent things on your own. So like I needed a server to like manage this stuff. And so that created two components, the server, which is a complicated thing, and the GGRL package, which is the thing you install on your computer, which is actually fairly simple comparatively. So before we go too deep into the rest of the talk, we're going to start talking about HTTP requests. Um, they're going to show up a lot in this talk, and they're really important. They're also, I think, way simpler than people have made them out to be. And um, frankly, when I once I finally understood HTTP requests, I was upset with software developers for making them sound more complicated than they actually were for like decades of my career. Um, so when you go to a website or you use an API, the vast majority of the times these use HTTP protocols. And at the end of the day, a HTTP protocol is just like your browser requesting, sending a text file request to a server and the text, the server sending a text file response back. That is the vast majority of internet traffic, really. If you go to google.com, that is your browser sending a quick text request to Google server saying, hey, send me the home page. And then Google sending back one text file, which is the HTML of that page. And now when you load that in the browser, your browser may say, oh, this actually requires other stuff and go pull more things. But at its core, it's still one text sent, text received. HTTP has a couple different protocols for different types of requesting and sending data. So a GET request is like literally like a, what a browser does. It's just going to a web page, getting a text response. A POST request is slightly more complicated. It is just, it's like a GET request, but you send data with it. So um, like if you are going to, you know, if you're on a web page and you, 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 you're filling out a form and you hit submit, that is your browser sending a POST request because you are going to that web page, you are sending the response and the response is all the things you filled out on that web page. Or if you upload something on a web page, you are generally sending a post request with the image you upload or whatever. So a post is just like a get, but with um, information attached to it. There are a bunch of other ones, but like those are two important ones, get and post. Um, you can send these HTTP requests yourself. Besides using a browser, which does HTTP requests, you can use the hitter package, or you can use tools like Postman or Curl. And so right at the bottom here, I have just some examples of HTTP requests um, with hitter. So like going, doing the get request to google.com, this is literally the exact same thing as browsing on your browser. If you run that R code, you will get a big ugly HTML file back. And that is the exact same file your browser gets back. A post is slightly more complicated because it just has a body, which is like either a text string or a file or something, but it's like a get, but just with data attached to it. I'm going way into this because it's going to come up a lot for the rest of this talk. Um, you can also send the request to different places and different things happen. So like if you do a get to like whatever your shiny app doc, you know, your, your app.com slash photo slash 18, that's usually like going to a website and getting the 18th photo of the user. And then slash photo slash 27, maybe you'll get the 27th post uh, photo of that user. So the idea is like the URL you go to after the domain, so like your app.com slash the rest of the stuff, like the slash the rest of the stuff is you telling the server, like what in particular do you want when you send that text request and get it back? Um, anything interactive on a web page is different, right? Like, like, you know, on Shiny, you got all these widgets, things around. That's all JavaScript. And JavaScript is like after that HTTP request happens, JavaScript is then doing more things. But that's like a whole separate line of reasoning. Um, but then importantly, the R app Shiny, when you interact with a Shiny app, what you are doing is the Shiny server is running. You are making a GET request to that page. It returns the HTML. And like, you know, in the Shiny app, you have like a UI component. That is you specifying what the what the HTML is, and then you use JavaScript to say, okay, but I want to continue to interact with the server on the back end. And then in the Shiny app, you also specify what the server back end is doing. Um, so you can actually receive, so you can send HTTP requests with header. You can listen and receive HTTP requests in like primarily two ways with R. One is with Shiny. Shiny is great because it does lots of this HTML and JavaScript designing for you. It's got this great UI. But at its core, Shiny is just something that listens to just get requests. So Shiny is only when a browser goes to a web page and listens for that. There aren't ways to do the other on their face. There's not ways to do the other kinds of requests with Shiny. It's just for browsers going to a server and getting like a web page back. And on its face, a Shiny app can only have one URL. It's generally like your shinyapp.com. There's not like your shinyapp.com slash 
part one of the app slash part two slash photos slash videos. It's just kind of one thing on its face. Plumber is um, more API focused. So it handles not just get requests, but post requests, whatever different types of requests. Shiny has that natively built in. Um, Shiny, or sorry, Plumber has that natively built in. Plumber does not have any of that HTML pretty stuff with like JavaScript and blah, blah, blah. It really is just handling these HTTP like text response, getting them and sending back texts or like an image file or a JSON file or whatever, but like one block of information. Um, so there's like on its face, there's no like JavaScript in Plumber. You could, if you were really working at it, you could make Plumber like actually send back HTML files that connect to JavaScript and actually like create Shiny within Plumber. Do not do that. That is not a fun set of things to do, but you could. Um, and Plumber has the feature that Plumber is like natively built in to have lots of endpoints. So you could have like your Plumber app.com slash photos slash video slash whatever. Um, and Plumber is a super cool R app. If you haven't used it before, really do try it because it's super easy to create lots of these R endpoints. So for instance, if you wanted to, to make it, so if you go to a particular URL with a get request, it'll do a sum for you. You can just in R write a function to compute a sum of two numbers and then make a Plumber a wrapper around it to say, hey, listen, uh, listen to this for this function as an HTTP request. And then if you went to that, that URL to do seven slash one slash sum with these two parameters, it would return the result as an API. So there's all sorts of reasons why you'd want to use this for like, if you have a model and you want another service to run the model with a certain sense of information. Um, this slide came from uh, for the last two in real life R Studio comps. Me and Heather Nolas spoke on behalf of T-Mobile about all the cool stuff you can do with R in production and Plumber. And I highly recommend you have, we have a blog post series about this. We have those two talks. They're really cool. You should really check them out. Plumber is really powerful for this HTTP stuff. So given that, let's go back to, to GGIRL. What is the correct, correct architecture of GGIRL? So here's how I think GGIRL should work, which is on your computer, when you're in R and you say, here's a ggplot2 plot I want to send as a postcard, take the, the package should take that image and send it as a post request to our server thing. And because on its face, Plumber is the thing that can handle post requests, we should have a Plumber listener that takes that post request, say, cool, I got the image, I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to tell you, here's the ID of that image. I'm going to pass it back to you. And then the GGRL package says, OK, I got that image. I'm going to go to that URL. I'm going to view that Shiny app. Shiny will then pass you to Stripe. Stripe will collect your payment. Stripe will say, hey, you paid me money. I'm going to go send the, the application, the knowledge that we send it. So I'm going to send a post request to this application and then Plumber, because it handled posts, listen to that. And then Plumber will send a post request to the sending a postcard service and will order the postcards. So that's in theory, the correct way to do this. But that requires two Plumber apps to run plus a Shiny app. Plus we might have to have a different Shiny app for each one of these like postcards, um, art prints, watercolor. So now we're talking like three Shiny apps and two Plumber APIs. And I absolutely refuse to do this. This is not feasible for me a lazy person doing this in my free time. So what is the actual architecture of GGIRL? It is a shamelessly monolithic Shiny app, which is to say, despite that there being all this R infrastructure around handling post requests with Plumber and Shiny apps, blah, 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 I just put it all in one big Shiny app. Um, I, I am shameless in doing this in the sense that like if you talk to like modern software developers, like the correct way to do things is the microservices. And a microservice says, split off little apps for each different task you want to do and decouple them. I don't want to do that because I'm lazy and maintaining a lot of things, a lot of work, and I don't want to do it. Um, I just want one shiny app. And there are actually a few reasons for this. So this is bad architecture, but I think it's actually good. And here's why. One is it makes it very easy to deploy. By having just one Shiny app that handles this entire process, I don't have to worry about, um, well, the Plumber app hasn't updated yet, but the Shiny app has, and now they're out of sync. Like, I just don't have to worry about any of that junk. Um, also, it is actually a surprising hassle to employ Shiny apps and Plumber apps to the same place. So like the Shiny server Linux um, server doesn't support Plumber. So if you want to use Shiny server on Linux, you can't use Plumber. If you want to use Shiny apps.io, you can't use Plumber. If you want to use Google Cloud Run, which is amazing for deploying Plumber, I've had real difficulty getting Shiny to work on that one. Although other people I think have successfully done it. I just haven't. Um, and then my Shiny apps.io account, I'm in the free account. And Shiny apps.io is great, 
but you only get three, or you only get five apps at any given time. And like I just described five and my five shiny apps.io apps, I do a lot of shiny development. Those things are precious. I'm not just going to give them all up. Um, I really just don't want to use all of my apps in this one thing on the shiny apps.io. So I really just want one single shiny app to do everything, which is to say that I talked a lot about how great Plumber is, and it is great. But I actually didn't end up using it for any of the development of GGIRL, even though it feels like I should have. Um, so it was a little bit of a red herring for a talk. But hey, it's Thursday night before a long weekend. Who cares? Conference rules. I'm just going to talk about whatever, even though I didn't use it. Cool. OK, so given that, how would one make a single sh monolithic shiny app for an entire e-commerce platform? So if you look at that last chart, like there's a ton of things going on. We're passing data to Shiny. Shiny is passing it to Stripe. Stripe's facing it back. We're passing it to the postcard service. That's a lot. How do we do it in one monolithic platform? Well, you do it one byte at a time. Um, I wish I had a more clever um, analogy there. Um, but let's start going through one piece by piece on how I actually did this. So the first complexity is how do you actually pass the plot from R on a computer to a Shiny app? Um, which is to say, when you're running R code and you say, OK, take this plot and show it to me on a web page, on a server that's running somewhere else, how do I do that with R and Shiny? Um, I thought this would have been really easy and a common thing to do. I just, I don't know, na naively assumed that all the time people were running R code that would then pass data to a Shiny app that was running. I found almost nothing on this. Like almost no one is out there doing this. Usually if a Shiny app needs data, that is loaded from a database or you upload it via a button. But rare is it that an R script that is actively running will send data to an actively running Shiny server. Um, and in particular, I just want to pass it a PNG image of what the postcard looks like, and then a bunch of stuff happens. Um, and the right way to do this is with a post request. So an HTTP post request of, I'm going to the URL of the Shiny server with this image to post it to. So I'm posting that image, and then I get response back of something. Shiny does not built in have that functionality, but it really should have that in a very open documented thing, because that's important for modern frameworks, and Shiny is a good framework, and it deserves it. Um, and in particular, let me just, again, walk through the steps here, because I think it is a little tricky, and these steps come up in other places too, which is that R code running on the computer. When I call that GG postcard function, what is it going to do is it's going to send a post request with the image to my like ggirl.art slash upload. URL. So it's going to post to that URL this image. And then the Shiny app is going to be like, OK, cool, got the image. I'm going to save it somewhere. And then I'm going to return the ID of what that image, like a randomly generated ID for that image. And then I'll be like, OK, cool, thanks for the ID. I'm now going to, I'm now going to a, do a get request in the browser, or I'm going to have the user go to the, the website, ggrl.art slash preview slash this ID. And then when they open the browser window to there, they will see that image preview with the image and the like text and stuff. So it's a it's a back and forth a couple of times to send the image, get the ID back, then send the go view it on Shiny. So there's no documented way to do post requests like officially, but there are a number of undocumented ways to go do this, which I will now enumerate. So first undocumented Shiny post hack one is um, there's something called the shiny.http.response.filter option for a Shiny app that lets you filter requests. So this came to me from Garrick Adam Bui. Um, and what you do is you, you set in your options, this is global options, not Shiny, but you set in your global options for R, the shiny.http.response.filter of a post handler function. And then in that function, you can say, well, if the request is a post, do something special. So the idea is Shiny has a backend way to say, before even Shiny sees a request, do some special filtering function where you do special stuff on it and then pass the request to Shiny. So if you want to do something like save the image URL or these, the image to a server and stuff like that, you could do it in this post answer. Um, I think this works. I think it is neat. I think it is weird that this is not documented. And I I don't know. It, it seemed OK. This is a good, good, good solution. Um, so undocumented Shiny post hack too. So I actually gave a much abridged version of this talk um, a couple of months ago at Cascadia RConf. And Joe Cheng, who was one of the other speakers there, he was like, you know, and also a leading developer on Shiny, he said, oh, 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 actually, there is another undocumented way to do this, which is the newer versions of Shiny have in the UI component, 
you can actually, in your UI, you can have like an, if this is a post request, do something special. So if the request is method post, then do your like saving the image to the server business. Um, and then you have to set an attribute on the UI for HTTP method supported get and post, and then this works. This I think is perhaps slightly more elegant than hack one, but this is, I would no have no idea how anyone would have ever known about this unless they also gave a talk at a conference on how a leading developer watch them and submit a, you know, a, a gist on Twitter about it. Um, so like that it exists, I wish it was a little more documented, but I didn't go with this one either. What did I actually go with? So hack three is the new brochure package. So this is an experimental pack package from Colin Fay. And it actually lets you do a number of really cool and helpful for me shiny things. So one is if you have like three shiny apps, like let's say you have, um, I don't know, something about postcards, something about watercolors and something about art prints. You can have those three shiny apps all roll into one app and each one have a different endpoint. So one app runs if you go to like the server name slash watercolor and one go runs if you do slash art print slash whatever. So this solves my problem of I want a bunch of apps running on within one app on different endpoints. This handles that. Another thing is those endpoints don't actually have to be shiny apps. They can also be post handlers. So one of the things in brochure could be slash upload. And what if you post request to slash upload, what it can then do is just save that file somewhere and then send a response with the ID, which is exactly what I want to do. Um, so this solves two of the problems I had, which is fantastic. And like, I just have to be tweeting about this. He's like, I'll try brochure. And I'm like, this is exactly what I want. Um, it is available. Uh, I will note that it is so new, it doesn't even have a hex sticker yet, which is a sign that it is very new and experimental. And also the very first text on this is, this is a work in progress, do not use. And I decided to use it in production for a service that handles money. Um, I actually had no problems with it. I think it worked nearly flawlessly. I had, well, I had exactly one bug I hit, which was very easy to work around and I assume is being fixed at some point in the future. But like, I love this package. I, I really hope it like grows and thrives and like this maybe even becomes a core part of Shiny because I, I just think it's fantastic. Um, okay, so then what is the final post request that ends up happening in this? So the GGIRL package, what it will do is it will do a post request that gets listened to by brochure. It sends what type of, medium it is, postcard, art, print, watercolor, the message, if it's a postcard, the address to mail this thing to, um, which could be multiple for postcards because you can send multiple at once, the PNG image that has been correctly sized for like a postcard or a water print or a water or art print or watercolor. And then also the package version that's running locally, because if it turns out you're real, running a really old version of GGIRL client, I don't want there to be an issue where the new server doesn't know how to handle it. Um, just note, I do send the PNG of the picture as like raw binary data in the post request. I originally toyed with the idea of actually passing instead of the PNG image, like actually just passing the um, ggplot object because then you could like rearrange it and resize it on the server. But the problem with this is that would require that any package you use to make the ggplot, like any weird like ggtext or other things would also have to be on the server for it to be able to render that correctly. And there's no way I could have managed that. So instead, I just accepted that I will turn it into a PNG on the client side and then send it to the server. Um, but because of this, because we are now passing a PNG image, not a, or not a GGIRL plot or ggplot2 plot, it's possible we could set any type of image, right? So long as the image is the correct size, I could turn anything into a postcard, including packages that are not ggplot packages like ray shaders, which are really cool. But this package isn't called R plots in real life or R art in real life. It's called GG plot in real life. And so for the morals of what I was trying to build, I did not choose to include generic upload any image as postcards or watercolors or art prints. Um, I don't know, maybe someone will convince me to do otherwise in the future. Um, so when the server receives the request, it generates a unique ID saying, here's the ID of that image you just passed me. It's like a UUID that's like 30 digit hexadecimal or whatever. It saves that image to Google Cloud Storage. So it can just always forever be used throughout this flow. And I don't have to worry about like, well, what if the server crashes or things like that? Like it's always in the cloud, we're good. And then sends that ID back to the GGIRL plot and the GGIRL, uh, sorry, the GGIRL package. Then the GGIRL package then sends the user to the URL of, in this case, for a postcard, it's the app URL slash postcard and the token of whatever that ID is, and that produces the correct image. OK, so we got a server that has the image stored in the cloud, ready to view, and then the user goes to that URL to view it. 
what happens next? How do we actually show the preview page and then get them to Stripe? So this is just a simple, fairly straightforward, shiny page. Um, there's not like a ton of like clever things happening here. Um, um, a couple things that were important. So one is I really want these previews to look exactly like what you're going to get on the postcard, which means like I have to be careful with things like the margin on the plot. Um, oftentimes the printers will cut off the very edges of your plot. So I had to like add a little extra white buffer to make sure that um, the plot looked correctly. And as a lot of people here probably know, ggplot is not easy where if you change the resolution of the image, then like the, the font sizes can change and things won't look exactly right. So I just needed to make sure there wasn't a scenario where the font would like, the font would look very nice on this image, but then when we send it to you, the font's too big or doesn't render correctly, things like that. Um, but the only actual inter interactivity on this whole page is that green button. You just click pay and submit. Um, I also, I like my shiny apps to look nice. So I use a package called boot, or I use a, a function, a framework called bootstrap. So bootstrap is a CSS framework to make web pages look responsive. So they change on mobile and stuff and look good. Um, the cool thing is, is that shiny is built around bootstrap. So if you start to learn bootstrap a little bit, you can very easily use it with shiny. The bad news is, is Shiny uses Bootstraps 3, which is six years old. And that's like so old. That is a thousand years in um, web development. Um, we are now on Bootstrap 5. We are like two major editions past three. Um, but the good news is, is our studio made a package to get around this. And if you use BSLib, you can set it to use the most modern versions of Bootstrap. I have a whole blog post about how to make Shiny apps look good on mobile, which is really just an introduction to Bootstrap for Shiny. Um, I highly recommend you check it out. And so what I did was I used Bootstrap on this thing, and I just set the theme to be the Boot Swatch theme Minty, and then I edited some variables. Um, just That's a good blog post. Um, just a little bit more detail around this page. Um, so like for the column sizing, I used Bootstrap grid functionality, which is good to check out. Um, we have this one button. This table, I used the GT table, um, the GT package to make the table look nice. I added the margin with the magic package to just add a white set number of pixels around it. And then for that shadow, I added a couple lines of CSS to the app that just for this particular size thing, you know, for this particular class of picture, add a drop shadow, add a little black border. Um, I will say though, originally in the version, the earliest versions of this app would actually not just show you a picture of the front, right? So here's a picture of front. Like why not actually show the back too and like have a little logo of GGRL logo on it. And like, why not do that on the postcards instead of just having a table? Well, it turns out it's super annoying to do this um, for a number of reasons, right? Cause like you really wanna get the back right, right? Like what happens if someone has a long word that's so long, this one long word would go over into the address field of the postcard and ruin it. What happens then? What happens if you have so much text, it gets to the end of the, the postcard? Um, what happens if your, your, your text has new lines in it? Then what then? Uh, uh, this was profoundly annoying. Like this is by far the most, maybe not by far the most annoying. This is one of the most annoying things of making this. Um, so originally the first idea I tried was I used, I figured, you know what? I'm making the front with ggplot. What if we made the backs with ggplot too? make the facts with ggplot too. That's a gg pun. Um, so for the idea one was I actually used, there's a package called gg fit text where I can say like, hey, make this box in the plot. I'll have text in it and have it correctly wrap. And this was decent, but it was kind of ugly. Like it wasn't that pretty. Um, and so then idea two was I, I, for other reasons, I switched to a printer a new printer and then that new printer, you don't even send them a back, you just send them what text you want on the postcard and then the printer will make the back for you. But that printer had its own set of problems. And also this is problematic because I couldn't then render the back because I only would know what the back went like would look like when I submitted the order. So I, I couldn't show the back. And then the last situation, the one I ultimately went with, the printer actually asked for an HTML file for the back. And this is actually really convenient because HTML has lots of good things to handle like text wrapping and stuff like that. But then I had to figure out how to take the HTML page and render it within my Shiny app. And I decided I just didn't care anymore. So I instead went with GT tables to show this data. But even here, it still was problematic to try and like, well, what if there's a new line in there? What, what if a person submits a character that is itself a markdown character and then GT thinks that's marked out? It was just intensely frustrating, um, which you wouldn't have expected from this very small part of the app. 
Okay, so then how do you pass the user from Shiny to Stripe, right? How does that green button work that when you press the button, it starts a Shiny or a Stripe order? Um, I would say overall, the Stripe app was surprisingly easy to use for the longest time as a data scientist. I'm like, I could never handle financial transaction. That's software developer stuff. I'm just a data scientist. But at the end of the day, these are still just HTTP post requests. Um, so the way Stripe has you do it is first in your server, like on your Shiny server, they have you send to, you post to Stripe what the shopping cart is of a person. And then Stripe sends back you, to you an ID of that shopping cart. And then you redirect the user to a URL based on that ID, which is exactly the same thing I did with the picture stuff in the first earlier part of this talk. Stripe does it with shopping carts. So you send the shopping cart, it sends you the ID, you send the user to the URL based on that. So to create the sh shopping cart or the Stripe session from Shiny, this is just a very particularly formatted post request. Um, when you hit that pay and submit button in Shiny, it sends that post request to the server. Um, I have a full working example of that button in the repo GGIRL example. So if this is a part of this tutorial, this talk that interests you, you can actually go make one of these yourselves fairly easily using that uh, repo. Um, but basically, I just made a function that you gave me the attributes of the order. And then I did a post request to Stripe's thing. I put in my credentials. So Stripe knew this is a real order. And then Stripe would respond with the ID, which I would then use to direct the user. Um, to actually direct the user based on that ID, there has to be a tiny bit of JavaScript run from Stripe. And so this is really just like two lines. Um, so we're, one, in the top of the Shiny app, in the head, I added the script of load Shiny's JavaScript, or load Stripe's JavaScript. And then I also added a second script of, if you press that button, at the end of the pressing the button step, run the Stripe JavaScript of redirect that person to checkout. So basically, Stripe is handling to direct to checkout. I just passed the Java, Stripe JavaScript and ID. And I'm saying the word JavaScript a lot. I'm terrified of JavaScript. I'm a data scientist. I don't have to deal with this stuff. But like, really, it was two lines I had to copy and paste into my Shiny app. I did not really touch JavaScript or had to reason about J JavaScript at all. And it just worked. Um, so then how do you fulfill the order? Um, so once Stripe gets money from a user, how do we make a postcard and an email happen? Um, so again, we're still sending post requests. So the idea is that Stripe is then going to send a post request to Shiny, and then Shiny will do the stuff to order the postcards. So this is this is this is a, a situation where I'm not sending post requests to Stripe. Stripe is sending a post request to me. That is called a webhook. If you see software developers talk about something called a webhook, that just means instead of you sending a post request to the API, the API sends a post request to you. Um, Stripe gives a little bit of guidance on how do you make how do you put in security checks to make sure that the post request coming to you is real and from Stripe and not from an nefarious R user trying to get free postcards. But I don't know, that wasn't too crazy to um, set up. Um, so then um, once Shiny gets that notification saying, hey, someone paid their money, Shiny will then send a post request to the company that prints the postcards. And Shiny will send an email to the user saying your order is confirmed. This feels like it should be straightforward. That looks like it's fairly straightforward. And it would be fairly straightforward, except for one glaring problem, which is that Stripe wants a fast response here. So when Stripe sends a post request to me in Shiny, they send a post request and they leave that connection open until you respond, yeah, we got it. We'll, we'll put that order in. And if it, you know, it might take a few seconds for Shiny to then query the postcard thing and then send the email. And actually, while Shiny's doing all this computation, everything on the Shiny server is stopped because Shiny is single threaded. So like Stripe is just waiting. And if Stripe waits more than a second or two and doesn't get a response, Stripe is a very anxious API. And Stripe just says, oh, you didn't respond. We're going to assume you didn't get that order. And that kind of makes sense because you don't want Stripe. Stripe doesn't want to be like failing to tell people that they got paid and then causing all sorts of a ruckus. So if Shiny doesn't, or sorry, if Stripe doesn't hear that you received their order, then they'll say, okay, I assume this was a failure and I'm going to try in like 10 or seconds or a minute. I will try again to put that order in and get a response. And again, Shiny won't respond until the actual work of putting in the order is done. And so the result of this, and if you're a, I don't know, naive data science, um, the developer in your free time, you may not put a check in to avoid sending, letting users make 
order duplicate things over and over. And so the result is that Stripe will keep hitting your API with the same request. And Shine will be like, cool, I'm getting all these cats. I'm going to fill these orders. But Stripe's going to be like, well, you're not getting back to us fast enough. So we're assuming these are all failures. And you get this, a wave of postcards being ordered. Now, I will say, in reality, the number of postcards that I accidentally got sent to myself was not as much as on this page. But I will also say that in the development of this app, or of this app I ordered so many postcards that by the end, I was opening my mail, I'd be like, oh, mail from me again, and just chunk it in the box. And like, I was spamming myself. And I hit that moment of realization of like, oh my god, what have I come to? Um, so the hacky solution would just be like, you know what? I don't care if Stripe keeps sending me the same request over and over. If after the first one, I'm just gonna ignore them. But for some reason at this point in the app, developing the app, I have standards and I'm not gonna let this be the, the hacky thing I do. Suddenly I care about not doing hacky stuff. But more importantly, they keep emailing you if your requests fail and I don't like it when I get annoying emails. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll just fix the problem. Um, but the fix is actually pretty cool. So what I had to do was I had to make it so that when Shiny fulfills the order, that happens in the background. So Shiny gets the request from Stripe. Shiny just immediately checks if it's a duplicate. Either way, it immediately responds, or it's if it is not a duplicate, it will kick off a process, a separate R process to do the ordering. And then because that's a whole separate process, this process, will be, the main one will be like, well, I did all the work I need to, I kicked off that other thing and I can respond with success. So in practice, I am no longer blocking Shiny by the actual work of putting the order. I call a new process to do that and have Shiny respond success. Um, this is based on a GitHub solution I saw to a plumber problem by Barrett Slurk, his solution to like some GitHub issue. Um, I, I like this so much, I wrote a whole blog post about it. But what you do is you use the caller package to spawn the background process. And so in your Shiny server, when this event happens, what you do is you're like, well, if this is a new task, I haven't seen this order or whatever before, I will then create a job for running the actual task and add it to this list of jobs that I have running. Um, this ends up being really cool. There's way more applications than just ordering postcards for the ability for Shiny apps to quickly spawn background processes that don't block things. I, I think some of the stuff is starting to get built into Shiny or into Plumber. It might be built into Shiny now too, and I just didn't know how to use it. But like, this is great. And I highly recommend that if you're doing stuff in Shiny where you have a long running thing that you just want to have it happen in the background, you check out the solution because it might help you. Um, okay, but how do you actually order the postcards? Well, it turns out there are many, 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 many companies out there that will take your money and then, well, there are a lot of companies that will take your money, but will take your money in exchange for having them host an API that when you send a post request to that API, they will then mail a postcard of it for you. There are so many of these because primarily these are used by companies to spam your mailbox with ads, right? If you're a company and I want to send out 50,000 uh, postcards and maybe you want a different postcard with like a custom message on each user, it's great to have an API you can just hit and pass it, like, you know, hit 50,000 times and get all those postcards sent. Um, the basic idea is, again, you just make a post request, but in that post request is like the image on the postcard, the address you send to, the message, whatever. But they vary dramatically on implementation, right? Some want an image for the back and some want text that they will turn into an image for what the message is. Some let you order for 10 people at once, some people, some of them don't. Some of them have price minimums. And I there's no way I'm going to pay a monthly cost to, to maintain this server, this service, which I have no idea how much people are going to use it. Um, or and like how quickly is the turnaround time? Um, so they all do this idea of you send an image, they send a postcard, but like the actual, it took me a while of experimenting before I found one I actually liked. Um, and I will say this was immensely frustrating. I think this maybe was the worst part of developing because I had so many companies that would send postcards and so many of them were terrible. Um, one of them that I almost liked and went with um, is this image on the right. I'm just getting mad looking at it. So if you look on your screen, you're like, wow, it's hard to read that image because Zoom's compressing it. No, that's not Zoom. This is actually what the postcard looked like. It was like, it looked like your grandparents sent you a Facebook image and then like they copied and pasted it into an email. Like it looked so bad and it was a physical object. And this thing was, was that I later learned that these API services, they don't just have one printer they always use. They often have different printers that they just randomly send your postcards to. So like with this one, like the first five postcards I ordered from them were great. And then suddenly the sixth and seventh were this super ugly, gross Facebook spam thing. Look, and the worst part of all was there was a two week turnaround time for almost any of these services between when I send the image and when the postcard got in the mail. So like this, so this product was delayed by months just by trying to get the right postcard uh, service. And for some reason, I have really high standards for my hypothetical customers who haven't even 
purchase these postcards yet. But like, I really want people, if you're getting artist stuff for the art to look good. Um, eventually I found one that I liked well enough, um, but even they had problems, which was, I was gonna originally have these postcards be international, but for some reason the service, when I shipped postcards internationally, they just never showed up. So I didn't formally publish that. Um, just writing the slide gets me mad and now reading this makes me mad because of how much time I put into this. Um, so it was a real struggle and I, uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't go great. Um, but in the end, I got one I more or less liked. Um, then to send the confirmation emails, I used the R package Blastula from, I think, our studio. It was really easy to send these emails. It was really fantastic. Um, one important thing, though, was that I both wanted to send an email to the user, but also it was a good catch for me so I could get an email confirmation every time an order was put in. And if there was an error for whatever reason, I would want, the e want to get an email with the error because like, if it just showed up in the shiny logs, I might not notice it. And with some of these threads being spawned, if like a, a spawned thread from shiny has an error, that doesn't even make it into the shiny logs because it's in a whole separate thread. So it was really important that I have emails to tell me when there are errors. And then I realized that sometimes the emails themselves had errors. So I needed to have an email that was just the email itself had an error. The error email had an error and there's like a cascading nuts sequence. Um, but all of that's done in the background and eventually it all got pretty stable to the point that that always generally worked. Um, for the email content, the images in there, one other thing is, especially with the postcards, but even more so with like the posters and stuff, those, those image could be massive. They could be like, you know, three, you know, even like 30,000 pixels wide, like they can be enormous. And I can't just put those into emails. So I had to resize them and stuff. So again, the image magic package was really helpful for this stuff. Um, and again, the back of the postcard was very frustrating because like if I put the text on the back, sometimes the email, like the blastula stuff, if I wasn't careful would like mess up the new line characters or like the markdown symbols would be red. So the, like that was just a lot of work too. Okay, so then how do I deploy it? So this is all hosted on shinyapps.io. So when I originally launched the first version of the app, which just started with postcards, I paid for a month of shinyapps.io just in case I got so much load that things were breaking. But it was totally fine with the base level. Like there actually isn't very much load being put on the server by the tasks you were doing with it. So I stopped paying. That was the one month I ever paid for shinyapps.io. And it was a great month, but uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, our CEO. Um, so it's really easy. It's really cheap. So now it costs me nothing because I'm still using the free version. Um, but what I also did is throughout my code, I put in the environmental vari the environment variable ggirl deploy environment to know if I was in dev or prod. And so throughout my thing, like the email that gets sent, the the way that I take the payments, all of them differ based on whether I'm in dev or prod. Um, and I actually in shinyapps.io, I constantly have two apps. I have the real one that people can use and the dev one for just testing. What I showed you at the beginning of this talk was the dev one. But when you go and use the app. If you go with GGIRL, you will go use the prod one. Um, this is nice because I could test things in dev and make sure I liked it. I could send post hypothetical fake postcards without um, without taking payments to myself or actually paying for the postcards. Although I then also would test in prod just to make sure things work too. Um, and then I made these functions for every time I want to deploy to production, deploy to dev, deploy locally, and I would just run the function to do the deployment, and that made things a lot easier. Um, and then lastly, I ran beta tests with like real humans and I had them test things and I ran surveys to see what people thought. And this is also immensely helpful because it both um, helped me catch a few bugs and also there are some functions, uh, features I didn't realize I necessarily would have wanted. And then they pointed it out and I'm like, okay, sure, I'll, I'll throw that one. Um, so that was mostly about postcards. Let's talk about the differences with GG Art Print and GG Watercolor. So for GG Art Print, um, there are a couple of changes. One is there are more formats that the user can specify within R. So they can specify if they want the plot to be a portrait or a landscape or how big. And so that image had to be sent or that information had to be sent with the original post. Um, I also like this is art prints. These are going on your wall. This is important stuff. So I really wanted them to look nice. And one thing you can do to make an image look nice is you can do anti-aliasing, which makes things look less pixelated. But um, the Cairo package is typically what I use for anti-aliasing, but I turned out I'd even like the anti-aliasing enough for this. So I switched to RAG, which was much better for anti-aliasing. But the point is, is that unlike the postcards for the art prints and ultimately the watercolors, when you are rendering it on the client side, like in R, when it's turning it into a PNG, it uses an extra package to make sure it looks extra pretty. And um, this meant that my package on the client side, like when you install it, it has to install RAG, like it has an additional dependency. And I really tried to keep dependencies out, but for this one, it was worth it. Um, I tried to keep them out because I worried the more dependencies that had, the more likely I would accidentally conflict with whatever your weird stuff you're doing in your plots. And I really wanted to avoid that. Um, and then I had to like, 
I had to use image magic to make the image smaller because it would be far too big to render on an HTML page. And then I had to use CSS to make this beautiful frame with like a nice shadow in there. So it looks like actually, actually it was important that I put a lot of work in to make this look like a picture and not just look like, 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 like a physical picture and not just look like, like your, you know, our studio rendering. Um, and I decided that was important. So for the fulfillment, what I ended up doing is I went with the, um, the same printer that I use for the art prints that I make, like of my actual watercolor and gouache art that you can get in an auction. Or if you want to buy it on my Etsy store, you can go to shop at janeolls.com and support me. Or you can buy it the original of some of my art at the art auction. Anyways, there's some shameless promotion. This is a very capitalistic talk. Um, but anyway, so that printing service, they do have a website for doing the printing. And I could have automated that. I could have used like the Selenium framework. And I think if they have an R package too, to make it so that when someone places an order, it automatically like clicks the buttons on the website and submits the order. Um, I chose not to do this for two reasons. One, I think that would have taken like 20 hours to code up and it would not have taken me 20 hours to fulfill all hypothetical orders for the entire lifespan of this future package. Like there's just no way it would ever take that long of work because it only takes me like three minutes to press the button and put in the order. Um, and then two, there is actually a nice human in the loop thing where if someone puts in the, the order for the plot and there's something in it that looks like a glaring mistake, I can try and catch it before it gets, um, before it gets ordered, um, which has happened before. So that ended up just being nice. And there at the bottom is that classic XKCD thing of like amount of time it takes you to automate a task versus how often you do it, whether or not you should. And like, it is so far off this chart, how much it would be worth it to automate the step of actually placing the order of the art prints. Uh, for the watercolor, the changes, the only major change from the watercolor is no, when you press the, the purchase button, it doesn't actually tend you to stripe anymore because I don't want to take your money until I know how complicated it's going to be to paint the picture for you. So instead, what does it does is it just sends the confirmation email to you and it sends an email to me, the artist letting me know, hey, contact this person with what you think the price code is. And then we can do the exchange on Venmo. Um, so I use Shiny's modal so that when you press request commission, it starts the like emailing order and then it pops up this shiny modal saying hey your request is submitted got it and then it, it stops the button so you can't like just keep pressing it over and over and send me 100 emails um and so i i'd never used shiny modals before but it was pretty seamless and i was pretty happy with it to fulfill the gg watercolors i just paint it um with watercolors those watercolors right there that photo was taken on the table right there like five minutes before this talk because i wanted to spice up the slide um Cool. So uh, to wrap it up, uh, GGIRL, it's a cool package. You can order stuff via um, our package. Um, there were a fair number of Fickly bits here, but like the core of this is really just a lot of post requests. You um, you have ProSure to handle all of the like all the different shiny and post requests at once, and then you bounce an R, you know, your R client when you run when you actually create your plot, it sends a post request to Shiny. Shiny sends a post request to Stripe. Stripe sends a post request back to Shiny. Shiny sends a post request to the postcard people. Um, you then use Caller in the background to avoid scenarios where Shiny lagging can cause problems in that flow. And I deployed to ShinyApps.io with Dev and Prod versions to test it and actually run it. Um, and I am so proud to say that I think in the last month or two, I've actually broken even and all of the and all of the actual substantial development costs I put into making this have now broken even. So I have not actively lost money, assuming my time is free, <laughs> um, which I didn't think I would ever do. So this is a very exciting achievement for me. Um, so in conclusion, thank you for coming to my talk. You can see the slides at link.jnolis.com slash ggrl.coc. You can order your own postcards, art prints, or watercolors today, right now, with that R command to install the GGRL package for you. And if you want to buy my art, you can go to shop.jnolis.com, or you can um, make a bid at the, uh, the R auction. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. That was uh, another classic Jacqueline talk full of energy and excitement. And I just, that was really, really great. So first, you know, golf clap, cause that's the best we can do right now. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for that wonderful talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, some of you may have noticed the uh, paint, one of the paintings Jacqueline showed in her presentation is right there behind me. So um, I, I'm not, this is not dog food. That's not, not the right word, but I've already bought into the artist. <laughs> it's already cool stuff. And I love that thing. Uh, my wife got that for me and I just in love with that painting. So everyone go to go to what shop.jnoles or jnoles.shop. Shop.jnoles.com. Yeah. There you go. Do that. If you want the Excel David and Goliath, bid on, bid on at the art auction. Cool. 
So I have a few questions. We are going to dive into those. Um, let's see. Well, oh, all right. Uh, the question that you answered, do you ship to Canada? And it sounds like no, because that's international. I I probably, if I put effort into it, could make my, at least the art prints and watercolors ship to Canada. If you want those things and you in Canada, just send me an email. The postcards, I suspect I will never get to just because the postcard sending companies are so dubious quality. But for the art prints and watercolors, um, email me if you are interested. Tested. Great. So for that, there we know that. Um, you said that you had the correct architecture, and then you sort of did answer this, but the person that asked the question, uh, how do you go about planning a correct architecture? And what's an example of an incorrect but reasonable architecture a new would make? So I think you sort of answered that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's a real truth to this. I think there's a there's like a certain, I think there's like paradigms in software development, which is the more you like make things into one giant software piece of software, the harder things are developed. And like you hear a lot about like modern so like software companies like Microsoft, you know, with their like office or whatever is like one so big piece of code that it's like almost impossible to add on to. And so the idea is if you split things into smaller, it gets better. But sometimes you can split things so small that the cost of it's easier to buy code, but it's harder to deploy and it's harder to keep them all in sync. And so I kind of was tongue in cheek saying that like the correct architecture is to have a whole bunch of plumber apps and things like that. I think in practice, there's not really a true right answer. And like, I think that like companies hire architects because they're people who sit around all day trying to weigh the benefits of different architectures versus the cost of these. Um, I do think if this was, if this is gonna get like 10 times more traffic, I would maybe switch to that like five app system. But given the amount of traffic this thing actually gets, it's probably fine the way it is. Yeah, he's like, so should each function be an API call for a microservice? That seems a little overkill. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you talked about brochure. Is that sort of like modules on steroids? Okay, so I have a confession, which is I do so much shiny development. I've almost never handled modules or done modules. I, my understanding, actually, I don't even know enough about modules to say this, but I will just shameless, or I will shamefully say that despite being a pretty reasonable shiny developer, I just never, Use but, but like, I will also say that like, I think shiny modules, my understanding of modules is they are one approach to handle the fact that if you have a super complicated shiny app where each widget affects all the other widgets, like modules can make it simpler. I think brochure is like a parallel approach of like, what if you had separate apps for each component of what you're doing and maybe you have a little bit of stuff shared, um, but maybe that's all I want to say because I don't know enough about this to say something smart. I asked that personally because I um I've worked on this app that was really complicated. I made like completely separate apps, and I just said, okay, I make an entire app into a module and stick that into like an app, essentially an app of modules. So it sounds mm -hmm. like brochure is doing a similar similar thing. I can see that. It's also like it, I used to use the sh Linux Shiny server, like the free version. Like you just spin up a, a Shiny server, and you can like run ten apps on that. Um, which is kind of like what brochure does, but brochure actually lets you pass things between the apps a little more, and also like. Shiny server isn't super supported by R anymore. So, or R Studio anymore. So, like, it's just not easy to use. Yeah, oh, that's actually a great question. So you answered my second question was like, does it pass stuff back and forth? The answer is yes. Perfect. Yes. Although, actually, I will say my apps very much don't very much. Most of what gets passed is in the actual request itself. Like, the post request will send the ID and things like that. And I originally did have stuff being passed between the different things. Like, I had a, a, a set of memory for all the different components that got shared. And I just got so worried. I'm like, well, what if I have three apps running in parallel because I have so much load? Or what if a, a, one of the servers crashes or things like that? I'm like, it is just better to, the moment I get any data, save it to the Google Cloud, and then just always be pushing and pulling from that because that's easy and cheap. Now, when you say save it to Google Cloud, do you talk? Are you talking about like a Google Drive, or are you talking more about like a bucket situation? Yeah. I am talking about a bucket situation. I use specifically Google Cloud Storage, and there's a package called Google Cloud Storage R. I find the package somewhat complicated to set up the credentials for, but once you set those credentials up, it is very easy to like just like AWS S3 is equivalent to this of just save it to a bucket and then pull it from a bucket when you need it. And I, I saved it by the ID, like the unique hash of each of the different pictures. I was just going to say, because AWS S3 is hard to set up, but once you do, it just sort of, oh, just pull that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we have a question. I'm going to go a little bit out of order because, like, apparently, Zoom, you can't copy and paste from the chat. So I had to manually type in the questions. So this one is staring at me. I'll just ask it. Um, since it started as a personal project, 
Can you describe how your time management process evolved once things started getting serious? Oh, that's a really good question. So what it was, was like, it was like two or three months of just idly thinking about like, well, what if it was like a thing you ordered watercolor from? What if it, I asked you to send you me a pay, Venmo payment? What if you'd blah, blah, blah. And then like, I did just have this moment where like, I was talking to Heather, I think Emily um, Robinson, a little bit about this too. And it all just clicked. And I'm like, okay, I feel like I now see the approach. And then I coded, coded real fast. And I hit this point where like, it was actually kind of interesting that the fact that I couldn't actually get the postcards yet kind of limited me. Like, because like, if I can't see how they look, I kind of can't do that much more development. Um, but I will say that it kind of got progressively like a stupid and stupid or like it was taking all my time and just like, but it was so fast. Fascinating. And like, like, especially with like the rendering the back, there were so many angles I could do to make it prettier. Like, I want to make sure the code gets like the ID gets sent to the email in case you have a problem, you can send it back. But like, should I send the whole code? It's easier to just only send eight digits. And like, I got like, I got way too deep in it. And then I got really bad. And then I released the po postcard part. And everyone liked it. And then I like, got like a break. And then it did like a little bit again for the water, or the art print, I got a little break. So like, I kind of paced after that. But the first part was not a healthy use of my time by the end. <laughs> <laughs> but a fun use at least? Oh yeah, no, this okay. is super fun. This is one of, maybe the most, it was it was kind of, I think the most intriguing project I've ever worked on. Like, I think it is the most like, like well encapsulated. It does like tons of different stuff. It's got things, it's got dev and prod and support email address. Like it is the most, it is the most well-rounded personal project I've ever done. Nice, that's awesome. That's really awesome. <laughs> that's cool. Um, for your drop shadows, did you check if Edward Tufte is okay with that? <laughs> um, okay, is he? I hope he's not watching this recording, but I'm gonna say, can I? I'm gonna like say some not great stuff. Uh, this is drop it. So I very early in my career, the first year of my career, I like, and my first job, I got like one of the few people from my company got to go hear Tuff talk. And I listened to him talk for a day, you know, when you buy the four books. And I listened to him talk and I'm like, this guy's so smart. He knows so much. I'm going to make all my charts way better. And like it way ingrained in me. And then only years later that I'm like, this guy is more caring about being technically correct. But like if everyone else in the company uses PowerPoint and you're there using your Garamond Excel file printed out in 11 by 4, like you're not actually working with a company. And I got really upset and I felt betrayed and resentment that Tuff was too over specific. And then I started to get like kind of snippy about him. And then I realized he follows me on Twitter. And then I just don't try and talk too much about Tuft anymore until right now. <laughs> we got it out of you. Yeah. So that's a tough saga. We had a talk a few years ago from Luda. Um, and she had a post about how like he talked about, you can't make this stuff in R. And everyone tweeted back at him, you can do it in R, you can do it in R, you can do it in R. And he started blocking everybody, including Luda. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know what that's all about, but I do think he's overly uh, dogmatic and also like, I don't know, it makes it look like a picture, so I like it. The end. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, so that's something less controversial. Um, what exactly is Google Cloud Runner? You talked about that a few times, very excitedly. Oh, yeah, Google Cloud Runner is super cool. Basically, okay, so a Docker container is like a way to record exactly what our version is installed and what packages you have and what code is in there and how do you run it? And so if you have a plumber API that takes, sends and gets requests, you can put it in a Docker container. And that means I'm gonna specify exactly the correct version of R and what Docker files and what plumber API functions there are and what data is in there and all these stuff. Me and Heather have a lot of material on there and I highly recommend people check it out. Google Cloud Run is a service that takes these Docker, takes any Docker container and says, when you hit an API, we run that Docker container for you. So if you have a plumber API, you can do like, you know, no, or like jnoles.com and then slash, you know, jnoles.com slash that sum function from the plumber slide. And then Google Cloud will receive that request, be like, okay, spin up the Docker container with R real fast, do the math, send the response, and then turn off the Docker container. So if you have a plumber API, it's super cheap to use Google Cloud Run because it only even ever has the Docker container running and the very small moments where people are using it. Um, so if you do things like Docker containers, um, Google Cloud is great for running that. I have had trouble getting shiny apps to work in Docker containers in Google Cloud Run, but I've seen blog posts where other people have successfully done it. So it's worth, maybe worth checking it out. But the point is if you have R code that needs to be like continuously listening for either as a shiny app or um, as plumber, Google Cloud Run is a really fantastic service for that. And so I'm assuming that it handles like scaling. All of a sudden you get 10,000 hits to this API, it spins up the image multiple times. Yes, exactly. And you just, you tell it like, what is the maximum number of instances you have set up? 
what is the maximum number each instance can handle at any given time if you don't want like 10 going to the same thing because that might break it. Um, it's all super good at that. And like all you need to pass it is a Docker container. And so far as I know, like AWS has nothing as convenient to use as that of like, they have lambdas, but like they, lambdas aren't well set up for R unless you do a lot of weird backend stuff that doesn't super work. Um, whereas Google's like, you give us a Docker container that's open to port 8080, we will make it work for you. So. Nice. And with Plumber, you can have multiple endpoints. You can do the same thing with this. The container, your container has multiple endpoints. Mm -hmm. And are those endpoints defined in the Plumber file or is it defined in the like, Google Cloud Runner config? It, it's all defined in the Plumber file. So all Google Cloud does is any traffic to your domain, it passes to your API, assuming, and it passes it to port 8080. So in your Plumber, like in the file I showed, I said, listen to port 80, because if you browsers use port 80. But anyways, if you switch it to port 8080, then Google will send it to your Plumber container. And it can, it, it will also like Plumber will handle the UR, the correct dom, uh, URL and all that stuff. And it, it's just, it's very seamless. It's one of the easiest ways to deploy Plumber apps um, I have witnessed. And where does the auth get handled? By Cloud Runner or by Plumber? By auth, which is one of the nicest part because Plumber does not have built-in authentication nor does Shiny, I think, and which is frustrating, but one thing you can do is you can build it into Docker, into your Docker container. You can add a layer for the auth stuff. And me and Heather have documentation on how to do that. But if you use a service like Google Cloud Run, you don't even have to put any auth at all because Google handles all that. And it only passes your Docker container, the traffic that has already been authenticated. Cool. Very cool to see. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. The Stripe request waiting time. Um, someone asks, is this related to indepotency tokens? I don't remember what those are. And I, don't remember, well, I don't know if I'm pronouncing indepotency correctly either. No, I think you're right. Well, here's what Stripe does. When Stripe sends you a, here's someone who paid money, what Stripe includes with you is a certain set of tokens. And you then have to take those tokens and your secret token and decrypt them. And when you decrypt that token, if it correctly decrypts, it's like, yes, this is correctly decrypt, which means this is an authentic thing because we only send it to you. But it also has a time in there. And if it like, if it decrypts, but that time was five hours ago, that means that this request, maybe it was real, but someone like copied it and they sent it to you again five hours later. And so don't use it. So you have to specify like, what is the amount of like, what is the window you're willing to tolerate in terms of the request being um, out of date? Um, I don't know if that is what those are about, but that is primarily how the Stripe token stuff works. Okay. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talked about call our RBG to uh, use something in the background to like mm -hmm. spin off asynchronous. Uh, is that sort of superseded the promises package? I'm trying to remember how they relate. I think caller might be a wrapper around promises or something like that. I don't uh, know. Oh, I, I think in relation to them. Yeah, I do think caller is like the latest, like the way most like our studio is currently like kind of sharing is what I've seen. Okay. And it's really very convenient. It's like, so, and, and I will say like, it's kind of, I find this stuff all kind of confusing, both with Shiny and Caller and less, because like concurrency means so many different things to so many different people, because there's a lot of places where like you do things concurrently, but you want to wait till they're all done before you do the next step. But like, this is like, I literally don't care if it takes me three hours. I never care about the result. All I want to do is fire off that end, that thing to get started and then never think about it again. And like the caller versus promises, I personally, or like Shiny has built an AC, I personally always am constantly getting confused on like which type of thing handles which type of those concurrencies yeah. best. I will say caller, I believe caller is the same framework that happens when you do like in our studio and you fire off a job of like, yeah. like I think that's all related and those are all cool functions. Um, so I guess I don't really have the correct answer, um, but I will say that I've I've had a lot of happiness with, I want to spawn off a whole nother thing and I don't want it to slow me down. Um, caller is really good for that. All right, cool. So targets uses caller also um, to do a lot of stuff. You can do caller R, caller RBG. So yeah, so it's, I guess that probably is the hot new way. Um, and then the last question I've written down, so in case anyone else wants to jump in here, um, do you, you talked about you have your dev and your prod of the environment variable. Do they each count as a separate app on shinyapps.io? They do. So I did decide to take the uh, two out of five hit to have them be two separate apps. You could imagine in theory, I could have it be the same app, except I really, like when I was developing the watercolor stuff, that wasn't yet published. So I didn't want to have it mess with the users who are still already using the postcards and art prints. So that was more of a like, I could have had it work, but then I would have lost the like, I want to be able to do stuff and break things without my customers having issues. Um, 
but I did have to like, I remember I did have to delete an R app I love and I don't remember what it was now. So I guess oh, I didn't no. love it that much. Yeah, it <laughs> you let it, if you, you let it go and it didn't come back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so is that typically the way of shiny apps? You want to have like multiple, let's say they're parameterized. This user gets this set of stuff. This user gets that set of stuff. Do you have to publish two completely separate apps or is the way of an environment variable um, allows you to do So what you can do in shiny apps, then a very nice easy thing you can do is you can in the URL, you can have tokens or sorry, you can have query parameters. So if you remember, I had question mark token equals blah, blah, blah. That mm -hmm. is a URL query parameter and websites are constantly using them. And you will look, if you go to a domain or URL, you'll see at the end question mark. And then this thing equals this, equals that. Shiny is very easy to handle query parameters. So like if you wanted to be able to like, if you wanted when you go to the Shiny app to see the red version, you could go to like your shinyapp.com question mark color equals red. And then that server would know. So if you want one shiny app that can do different things for like based on which URL you go to, it's not that bad. But if you want like two totally separate apps, then that doesn't really work so well. Like you could have two separate apps and like at the top of your app have an if statement of like if, but like, I don't know, it's ugly. And brochure kind of does a lot of that for you, so. Okay, cool. All right, so I think that was the last question. I was gonna check Zoom, I'll check Slack. All right, that was all of them. So. Yeah. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Uh, I learned a lot because it was just fun. Uh, so I hope everyone else had a fun time and learned a lot as well, just like I did. Yeah. Um, and we hope to see you again, one of our meetups or our conferences, both virtual and in person. And um, anyone wants to see more of Jacqueline's stuff, come check out her art auction at the um, rstats.ai. Oh, and if you want to see previous talks she's given as part of this community, rstats.ai has a whole video page of previous year's videos. I've done at least two or three of the conferences in the past. So go check out that stuff there. Of course, she has other stuff. No. And they're all about a zaniness. That's fun. People yes. love the zany. <laughs> yes, indeed. The zaniness is an important part of it. Yeah. All right. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. I want to have a great night and I'll see a bunch of you at the conference next week. And those of you I'll see you around next month or future months. Bye, everyone. Bye.